the rest of my unit has finally arrived to Camp Spiker where we are and we help them get settled as much as we can get the vehicles parked and get some of their immediate gear off and show them where they can sleep for the night um, there's a lot of people a lot of equipment a lot of confusion it's really loud there and just trying to do our part to get everybody settled and one of my friends finds me and he was he was part of the main body and so we obviously hadn't been around each other for I think a week or so and so he finds me and we catch up a little bit and exchange a little bit of stories about uh, our adventures since we last saw each other and so he goes to pull me to the side and says um, hey I, I gotta tell you something and I'm not supposed to tell you and of course I'm like what what is that you know what is it and he says there's something wrong with your son Welcome to episode 16, my first phone call from Iraq in 2003, and I am your host, Master Sergeant Jason Miller, and this is Miller's Military Moment. So I want to take a moment and thank everybody for all the listens, the support, the feedback, definitely a lot of support from the uh, podcast community, which has just been a lot of, uh, a lot of help. Um, encouragement, you know, feedback, constructive criticism on the show and stuff like that. And it's just been great. And I really appreciate that. And definitely for all the, the friends and family and listeners and watchers on YouTube out there, my YouTube views are about as equal as my listens on the podcast app. So that's pretty cool. So anyway, just wanted to give a shout out to everybody out there and thank you so much for all that. I've uh, appeared on a couple of shows. And I've got a couple more guest appearances coming up, and I'll let y'all know when those are released. But it's been great having the opportunity to appear on other people's shows and share some of my story and talk about their stories and, and what's going on and on their shows, which is really cool. The um, podcast community is just uh, its a great group of people. We all have a different story or a different genre or something we're doing, and it's really rather interesting seeing and hearing everyday people do some amazing things and amazing creative things out there so it's really cool so anyway thanks for all that and um, i'm just i'm having a great time with all of this and um, enjoying every part of it so i definitely appreciate that um you know hey stay safe out there you know we still got the pandemic going on if you uh can get your shot and you want to get your shot hey absolutely go for it i got my first one and you know in a couple weeks i can go and get my second one so but hey you do you be you if that's not your thing you know but if it is and it comes up hey by all means go get it and let's do what we can to help everybody else out there and on another note 38 days and a wake up and i sign out from the army so pretty excited about that we're almost to the finish line and then getting ready for our next big move in the next chapter in our life which is um, moving to atlanta and who knows what happens after that so, but we're excited and I, you know, appreciate you guys coming along for the journey. So it's pretty cool. Uh, so, Hey, you know, the, um, my friend that found me when he got to Iraq, got up to camp Spiker where we were, you know, he came over and, and told me some pretty, uh, emotionally downing news. I mean, he, you know, it says, um, you know, something's wrong with your son. And I mean, my heart sank. I mean, I, like, you know, what, what do I do? I mean, what, what can I do? I'm 7,000 miles away. I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this news. And he doesn't even know what is wrong or if there's anything that's wrong, but he sounds and seems very concerned. And so you may wonder, well, how does he know? So, he was a week behind traveling. So when he was in Kuwait, he was still able to, to find the phone and use the phone and his wife and my wife had connected a little bit. So 
when he talked to her, he had a chance to, my wife had told um, his wife that there was some issues. And so that's how he passed the message along. Now, my commander and first sergeant also knew of the issues and they did put the order out to not tell me. And this is why, because we did not know if there was anything really wrong. There were some preliminary tests that showed there could potentially be something wrong, but they needed to do some more tests to find out. So in the situation we're in where I can't do anything about it and worrying and being upset about it isn't going to do me any good. It's not going to do my son any good. It's not going to do my wife any good. So they had put the order out to not tell me until we knew that everything was okay. Now, my commander did have a way of communicating a little bit more often back home than the rest of us officers um, and typically commanders of units. They can find those ways or get offered those ways. And it's not that they, you know, are have something afforded to them that's not afforded to everyone else. It's just they typically use it uh, to communicate with the family readiness group leader, which is often their wife, who, you know, has a lot of information about our spouses and stuff like that. So um, they typically use it for good reasons. So they didn't want me to know, but my friend was like, I don't care. I want you to know. I think you should know, which he meant well. But of course, I'm like, I'm pretty upset about it. Like, holy smokes, you know, what do I do? Um, well, and a little bit of background too on, on this, this friend who really ended up not being, you know, that close of a friend and never really talked to him much after this deployment. So he really didn't want to go on this deployment and didn't want to go so much so that he went AWOL before we were supposed to leave. But since since we were friends, the command had me show him where he lived and we had to go and knock on the doors and literally drag him outside and he got into a little bit of trouble. So um, he was not as likely to listen to what they told him to do versus what he thought was best to do. But so anyway, he told me and the platoon sergeant saw that he was talking to me and could see probably my facial expressions and my emotion and you know immediately came over there and talked to me and took me to the commander and so he just said look he probably knows and so we we discussed it and said yes i know what you know please be honest with me you know don't hold anything back from me and this is what they said they said you know this is what we know is that preliminary tests show that there could be something wrong we don't know for a fact that there is, and there's no reason for you to, you know, be upset or to focus on that right now because we just don't know. So everything could be fine. And it's, it, while it's, you know, that's easy to say, sometimes it's hard to do to, you know, remain focused on, on that, especially when you're so far away. And what are the chances, you know, what if I don't make it home? I mean, that's a real possibility, you know? So, but they did assure me that it, it wasn't that they were trying to keep something from me. They really were, just didn't want me to worry for no reason because there was nothing I could do at this point. So, um, so I appreciated that and it did allow me to kind of go back and focus on what we were doing, which was setting up our, our area. And we're talking you know, an area, a living area and work area for about 300 soldiers. I mean, this is a lot. And I, there will be more pictures later on when we talk a little bit more about my living area and the tents and stuff like that. But we had to set all that up. So if you can imagine, you know, the 25 to 30 tents to house all these soldiers, generators to supply power, you know, because we had to supply our own power. There is no power grid over there. It's all knocked out and you know, worthless at this point. So we have generators to supply our own power, you know, so we can have lights in our tents so that we can run our maintenance equipment. And, you know, then of course the water purification guys that I talked about with the pools, they're on the other side. So we have to get fresh water from them every day. You know, there's a lot of things that, um, you know, have to go on to get us set up to be able to do our job and perform aviation maintenance. Meanwhile, we still got to provide our own security. 
with food, how are we going to eat, where are we going to eat, you know, when do we get fed, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of things going on. So I was able to really kind of dive back into that, get busy, get focused. And, you know, they assured me that, look, if they hear something, if they know something or and or when the next tests are done, if they can get me a phone call home, that they will do their best. Um, but they made no promises because, again, we're 7,000 miles away. You know, there's no uh, phone booth down the road that you can just go put, you know, 35 cents in or even call collect, right? So, and some of the communications um, that we had in our own, you know, unit weren't set up yet and, you know, weren't able to, to be used. So, so with all that being said, you know, um, get back to work and focus on that stuff. But of course, I mean, I think about it and, you know, um, especially I think at night whenever I was like getting ready to go to sleep and, you know, you think about, you know, at home and that's not unusual anyway. Um, anytime you have some downtime, you're, you're thinking, you know, about home and they're thinking about you as well. And, you know, it's, it's a mutual thing where you just, you have no idea what's going on back there and they have no idea what you're going through. So it's, um, it's pretty nerve wracking sometimes and what's best for everybody. And we learned this kind of early on was to develop routines. And a lot of the spouses learned this from the family readiness groups and other people that were involved, develop daily routines that kind of get you up and moving and get you focused so that you're not sitting around doing nothing. Now, we were extremely busy, so that our routines definitely came into play pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, especially early on, the first several months, I mean, communication was just, I mean, letters, which were four weeks old. But each night, if you, you know, sat down to write some stuff, it felt like you were talking to them. That was our way of communicating early on. And so I did that a lot. Um, I wrote a lot of letters, and we still have... I thank all of the letters that we exchanged with each other um, in a, in a shoebox uh, packed away in a box somewhere. So, um, you know, I wrote in those letters and just concern for each other and, and um, you know, love for each other and hope they're doing well and they're safe. And, you know, so they develop their routines. We develop our routines to try to keep us focused and, you know, even just under the normal circumstances of being away. But now this issue, you know, with our son, kind of adds a little bit more of that worry and that concern so you know it was um kind of a tough tough time for sure and 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 also when you are in that initial phase of the combat phase where we're invading and we're setting up our area of operation your workload is a lot more than normal so i mean 12 to 15 hour days is the normal and we are exhausted there's a lot of physical work going on so a lot of stress, you know, look, you can't do anything fast enough and you can't do it right. And I'm just, that's just how it is. You know, you, you set up tents and you got to take them down and move them because that wasn't the right way. When you're trying to lay out a, an area for, you know, 300 soldiers, it's, it's pretty tough. So a lot of things get moved and then you've got to tear them down and redo it. And it's, you know, frustrating, but a whole lot of manual labor. So you're physically exhausted, you're mentally exhausted and we're, you know, a month into this. So a lot of challenges going on at that same time. And, you know, and then I'm thinking about home and what, what I could do and, you know, hopefully everything's okay. And so the other thing, you know, the commander assured me of is like, look, if it's, you know, serious life or death, if it's a life or death situation, then we will get you home. We will figure it out and we will get you home. So that also helped me uh, feel better about it that I'll, I'll at least get a chance to be there, you know, with my wife and with my son in case something tragic were to happen. So I don't know, a week or so after all that, um, the commander came and found me and said, Hey, I think you need to call home and I've got a way for you to call home. And I'm like, okay. So he says, I'm not going to tell you the details, but everything should be okay. But I want you to call home and talk to your, to your wife. And so meet over here at a certain time and get in the Humvee and we'll take you 
somewhere. So I'm like, okay. So I get my stuff and I'm like, you know, first of all, it makes me feel a little bit better. Well, I mean, he's not freaking out, but also kind of coming through and giving me the opportunity to talk. So, uh, get in the Humvee and roll over there 20 minutes on the other side of the airfield. And there's some civilians milling around and they go and talk to somebody. And then the civilian comes and gets me and kind of takes me around the building so I could have some privacy on the other side. And he, he shows me how to call. He has a satellite phone. So I'm like, who has satellite phones? Like is what I'm thinking. So the civilians, some of them have satellite phones and you're, you're wondering who is the civilian. He's an American that is an aviation um, liaison officer. We call them Lars. They're, um, they are basically go-betweens for us doing aviation maintenance and the engineers with the those components or the aircraft back home that they need to ask questions. So we have books that tell us how to how to do all the maintenance and all the inspections, right? And there's criteria that says, well, if it is damaged this much, then it's bad and you have to replace it. Well, you know, early on we didn't have a whole lot of parts, and maybe if this part isn't a flight critical part, maybe we could still use it or you know fix it a little bit. So we would go to them, they would contact the engineers back home, and then they would kind of figure out, you know, okay. Since it's not flight critical, yes, you can reuse that and then just annotate this in the logbooks, so on and so forth. So that's who he was, and that's how he had a phone. The company paid for this phone, and you essentially could contact anybody all over the world. And so the commander, you know, talked to him and told him the story, and he was, oh, of course, you know, here. And um, so he showed me how to use it and dialed and called, called home, and I was able to call uh, my wife and. Um, she answered, uh, shocked and surprised. And, um, so the delay, there was still a delay. It wasn't as bad as the, the phone on the army system in Kuwait, but there's still a little bit of a delay. So I just talked slow, you know, let her respond. And the bottom line was all tests were negative. My son was going to be just fine. And I can attest to you, he's still just fine. He's an amazing, uh, smart, intelligent young man. And so then we spent, you know, a few minutes just kind of talking and, and, you know, the biggest thing is saying, I love you, you know, and listening to her tell me that and just, I miss you. And, you know, it's great hearing your voice and sometimes a little bit of small talk like that just goes a long way. And so, yeah, we had the opportunity to do that. And, you know, what's interesting is I, I, we didn't talk too long I think definitely it was less than 10 minutes part of it was I was relieved that everything was good so you kind of have that that adrenaline down if that's the right word to say like you just you know you let out that that breath and you just feel better um, and so after that though like I felt a little guilty now talking on the phone to my wife because not everyone else can and here I am, you know, talking. I know it was extreme circumstances and they were legitimate circumstances for me to talk to her. But it's like, OK, well, now that I know that, like I need to I need to go and get get back. So there was a little bit of that guilt going on. But I think we talked less than 10 minutes, but it was uh, an incredible opportunity to talk. And thank goodness that everything, um, you know, worked out uh, with my son and family. And, you know, it helped me return to work with focus. So now I can, I can really get back to just focusing on my job, my teammates, you know, what we've got to do. Cause it was, it was a lot. I mean, that first year I'll tell you in Iraq, I mean, 2003 to four was, um, it was a, a lot of work physically, uh, emotionally, there was, you know, a lot of things going on and it was definitely a tough, tough deployment, tough assignments and, um, needed a lot of, a lot of focus. So, it, but it enabled me to do that, which was, um, great. Um, and you know, so yeah, so that's my first phone call from Iraq, uh, to, you know, to home, which, you know, was not under the best circumstances, but at least I had a chance to, to say hello and know that my family was safe and good to go. And I could tell her that I loved her. And she told me, uh, the same and, you know, not knowing when the next time 
I was going to get a chance to talk to her on the phone. I had no idea. And, you know, we just have to wait to see how things played out up to that point. And so at that point, you know, we really just focused on the letters and, and communicating that way as much as possible. But yeah, so there you go. My first phone call in Iraq and, you know, under extenuating circumstances, but it all worked out well. And communication does get better over time whenever, you know, about six months into the rotation there, it gets a little bit better. But there you go. So a little bit of uh, insight into that first phone call and the situations uh, surrounding it um, and why, you know, I had to make it or why I had the opportunity to make that phone call. So this concludes episode 16, my first phone call in Iraq. You know, thanks for listening or watching on YouTube. I definitely appreciate it. And if you're watching on YouTube for the first time, hit subscribe. And uh, that way you know when my next video comes out. And if you're not following on the other uh, podcast apps, make sure you go and hit follow. I think Apple has changed from subscribe to follow. So follow on your favorite podcast uh, listening app. And if you're interested in learning about insights and updates to the show and to what's coming up on the show, you can go to my website, millersmilitarymoments.com and register, uh, sign up for my weekly newsletter um, just by providing your email. And I'll send that out every Tuesday afternoon. And we've got some more exciting shows and things coming up. I've got a guest coming up next week, uh, which is going to be um, really exciting. He's a former Marine and you get an opportunity to kind of hear some of his experiences um, throughout the global war on terrorism. So looking forward to that. So again, hey, Take care of each other, take care of yourself, and you know if you have an opportunity to reach out and help others, uh, please do so. Do what you can to make your place and our place just a little bit better than what it was yesterday. So until next time, peace.